The following document is provided in response to the video on YouTube which goes by the title, True Story of Sri Ganesha by Dr. Zakir Naik. I'm going to use Zakir Naik style only to answer the questions about idol worship and other concepts. First of all, even if there is something wrong in any religion, actually there is nothing wrong in any religion including Islam and Hinduism, why is Zakir Naik going out publicly? proving other religions wrong and begging to accept Islam. Is he afraid that Islam would vanish? Questions asked in the video are, as follows. 1. Is Ganesh a true god? 2. Is Shiva a true god? 3. If Shiva is a true god, then how can he kill his own son? 4. If Shiva can't even recognize his son, then how can he recognize, Zakir Naik, and protect his devotees? I am gonna answer all the above questions at the end, but I have some logical questions for Zakir Naik and for the rest of the Muslim community. Discussion point 1. Prove that Allah exists and his rules on the earth are right. 1. How can a boy love a girl whom he has not seen, not heard, know nothing about her, cannot imagine her, as her shape is formless? First make us feel and prove that Allah exists and then, we will accept Islam, not before that. 2. Muslims don't believe in past life, rebirth and karma rule, then, people who are born poor, ugly, crippled, diseased, unpopular have the full rights to say that Allah has done a great injustice and partiality to them by giving them sufferings by birth without any reasons and by making others more beautiful, wealthy, famous and happy. This means, that either Allah doesn't exist or, even if he exists, he is very very partial. In both cases, Islam has been proven wrong. Why is Allah formless? Why can't he have a form? Why is idol worship wrong? Muslims say that Allah is unlimited without any limits and so is formless. Until here, we Hindus also agree, but it is only one of the aspect of the God and not the only aspect of the God. They can also have forms take it, as Muslims think that water can have only liquid aspect. It is true, but it is not the only aspect. Hindus know all the three aspects of the water and they say it can have liquid, ice and vapor forms. God means one who has no limits either in shape or in actions and then, if you say, God can do anything, but he can't do only one thing, that is having a form, how absurd. It means, that you are limiting the powers of the limitless God. Zakir Naik says that Vedas are the highest authority in the Hinduism and it is written in that idol worship is wrong by quoting that Vedas say God is formless. First of all, who said that the Vedas are the highest authority? They share only 40% of the authority, the rest 60% is ruled by Agam and Migam Shastras, also known as the Tantric Scriptures. These scriptures are full of detailed description of various forms of gods and goddesses and the methods of worshipping them. Even if we consider only the Vedas, it says that God is formless, but nowhere it is written that it cannot have forms and there are many gods like Indra, is a demigod, Rudra, Vishnu and others who are praised and worshipped using their forms in the Vedas and this supports the fact that Vedas are not against the idol worship. Zakir Naik openly lies in front of the Hindu people, because he knows the fact that the majority of the Hindus don't even know the basics of their religion. In one of his speeches on idol worship, Zakir Naik says and dash Hindu pandits say that initially, they need an idol to concentrate and then, when their consciousness gets highly evolved, then they go for formless worship, but we Muslims are highly evolved by birth and so we don't need any idols to worship. How sad, the majority of the Hindu pandits doesn't even know the tantra behind the idol worship and are giving such stupid answers. Formless means one who has no form in any possible way be it be a sound, symbol, place or an idol. Another meaning of formless is one who can take infinite forms for example water is formless, it will take the form of the jar in which it is poured. Before going further I want to apologize in advance to Muslim community for using false language but in the context of this argument I have to use that but believe me I'll never support such offensive words against any god or messenger or even son of a god. So here I start. Okay, so our highly evolved, spiritually advanced Zakir Naik and the Muslim community answer the following questions. 1. If I say that Allah is a bastard, 
Allah is a rapist and by hearing this, if any Muslim is beginning to erupt like a volcano, then he must admit the following points. Point. You accept that the word and the sound Allah represents your almighty unlimited God. Point. This means your unlimited God has been confined to a small word of five letters Allah. You accept the fact that your formless God resides in the sound Allah and thus he has a sound form. 2. If I urinate on Quran, drop my feces on it and then burn it down to ashes and by seeing this, if any Muslim is beginning to erupt like a volcano, then he must admit the following points. Point. You accept that the Quran is equivalent to and represents the almighty and limited formless Allah itself. Point. This means your unlimited God has been confined to a book. Point. You accept the fact that your formless God resides in the book Quran and thus has a book form. 3. If a group of people go and smash down a mosque and damage it beyond repair, and by seeing this, if any Muslim is beginning to erupt like a volcano, then he must admit the following points. Point. You accept that the mosque represents the place where your unlimited formless Allah resides. Point. This means your unlimited God has been confined to a place. Point. You accept the fact that your formless God resides at the mosque and thus has a place form. Muslims are themselves worshipping the Allah in all the above three forms and are not ready to accept that Allah Almighty God can have forms. If Allah is omnipresent, then it means it exists in each and every form in the universe be it be an insect, animal, water, fire, air, empty space, sound, stone, urine, feces, penis, vagina and each and every particle of the universe. So, if Allah exists in all these places, why can't you worship him in all these forms? That means your Allah is not omnipresent and can be accessed only in three ways, word Allah, Quran and the mosque. Now for idol worship, we Hindus believe that God is both formless and with forms and is also omnipresent. This gives us the right to worship him in each and every particle of the universe including ourself, known as Advait Sadhana in which there is no difference between the deity and the deity. But we accept the fact that it's not easy to harness the power of God from each and every object of the universe by ordinary men and it can be obtained only in three ways. 1. Devotion. 2. Tantra. 3. God's Grace. In fact, both devotion and tantra needs God's grace to yield results. If anyone thinks I have missed yoga, then they are wrong, as I have always considered yoga as a part and parcel of tantra and not as a separate entity. First of all, Hindus don't worship the idol as Lord, but they worship the Lord as idol. There is a difference in both of them. It is like every president is a human being, but every human being is not a president. A very famous saying is used by Indian Siddhas to show this difference. Pather Puji Hari Mili, mean Puji Pavad. It means, that by worshipping a stone, if one can get Hari, Lord Vishnu, then I would worship a mountain. Unfortunately, majority of the Indians think that this phrase is used against idol worship. The most important part of idol worship is Murti Vijayana, idol science, and Pranan Prathista. Pranan, life force, and Prathista, placing or invoking. It means to invoke the life force of the desired deity in the idol using mantras. As long as the Pranan Prathista is not performed on an idol, it is as good as dead. Now, people can ask. First you say God is omnipresent and then you say Pranan Prathista is necessary before worshipping an idol, both are contradicting each other. Actually, Siddhas, one who has realized God don't need any sort of Pranan Prathista, they will naturally see, feel and experience God in each and every particle of the universe, but for ordinary men it is not possible to have the same, because they are at a very low consciousness state. For them Pranan Prathista is a grace of God, by which they too can see, feel and experience God in that particular idol. After realizing God, the whole universe becomes a living idol for them. Once the Pranan Prathista is performed, any particle of the universe including urine and feces are able to shower the grace of God. Nowhere has God ever said that you cannot worship him in such and such thing, but you can have the right to worship God in your in and feces only, when you have completely removed your hatred feeling towards it.
This can be tested by, if you are able to eat any urine and feces with the same pleasure, as you do, while enjoying other delicious foods. This high state of consciousness is always present in Siddhas. As long as you have not achieved this state of consciousness, you have no right to worship God in the things which you consider to be disgusting. Why not? Consider the following two cases. Point. A mother nursing her male baby. Point. A man sucking the breast of his wife, mother in the above case. In both cases, we see similarities, but the emotional level of the male baby and the man are totally different. The man here is full of sex, enjoying his wife, while the male baby is getting his food. You can try as hard as you can, but you cannot make that male baby see the breast of his mother in the way, as the man is seeing it, while he is having sex with his wife. Similarly, the emotions of the same woman are totally different in both the cases. Now replace the characters in the following way. Woman equals God. Breast equals feces. Man equals ordinary men, surviving for food, sex, shelter and ego satisfaction. Baby equals Siddhas, one who has realized God. And you have your answer. A man cannot imitate baby emotions while having sex with his wife, it's not possible. He will always see a woman's breast, as an object of sex and pleasure. On the other hand, a woman cannot imitate to show motherly emotions towards such a man. Similarly, both the god and the devotee will show their natural emotions towards each other irrespective of what the devotee is trying to act. So don't try to imitate Siddhas by worshipping God in the things which you consider to be disgusting, be true to yourself and worship him according to your level. The conscious level of Siddhas is so high that they cannot see anything as disgusting. They have baby consciousness. Everything for them is God. One such Siddha, telling Swami, once worshipped Kashi Vishwanath, the most sacred Shiva Linga, idol of Lord Shiva, in Banaras using his own urine and feces. The temple priest got mad at him and slapped him. The same day, the king of Banaras in his dream saw Lord Shiva saying, How dare you insult telling Swami? He is my essence. The very next day, the king ordered to search for the priest who was mysteriously found dead. As the mother sees her baby, so does the god see Siddhas. A woman can fight with her husband or may feel bad if he does not treat her well, but in case of the baby, even if the baby urinates, vomits in her lap or do anything disgusting, his mother will always see him with the same intense love and care. So, first go and achieve baby consciousness, if want to worship God in the things which you consider to be disgusting. God loves everyone equally but he will always treat an ordinary man and a siddha differently. This is not partiality. A woman will love her husband and son equally but she will not have sex with her son. If you want, you can call it partiality. Same love with everyone is possible but same behavior is not. Even after all these rules, you may still be blessed by God, even if you worship him in the feces with an intense disgust feeling, because God is the only being who cannot be bounded by any rules. Coming back to idol worship, one may ask, what is the need of designing the idols in the shape of gods and goddesses such as Krishna, Durga, Ganesha, Tara, Kali, Shibarava etc. and why not worship them in any ordinary form such as a square or a circle? First of all, none of the gods and goddesses of the Hindu tradition are imaginary or symbolic. They are as real as we are. Great sages, by practicing mantra sadhana and extreme austerities, had the glimpse of various gods and goddesses. Then they wrote down their physical description and the rituals to worship them and these came to be known as the tantric scriptures. There is a type of tantric marana, killing, ritual practiced by Indian fakirs using Muslim shabar mantras having a mixture of Hindi and Urdu language. Any Muslim can confirm it by asking a genuine fakir. In that we can kill our enemy from any distance by using a dummy. Whatever damage is inflicted to the dummy, that same damage instantly occurs on the enemy's body. If we break the leg of dummy, leg of the enemy will break. If we pierce the dummy with a needle, blood will flow out from enemy's body. Something similar happens in the idol worship. Whatever you do to the idol, the same is received by that particular deity at that very instant. 
Thus, idol worship is the grace of God through which he lives at your home, receives your love in whatever way you want to give it to him. If, on a Krishna idol, you apply the paste of sandalwood on his face, that very instant he will receive and feel it on his face, because he is there, in that idol. Therefore, idol worship is for loving your deity and not for concentration. The only thing that matters here is to perform a parakt pradhan prathista, which is not an easy task. There is a vast tantric science behind Marti Vigjayan, pradhan prathista and that too, you have to master it. In case of the Marti Vigjayan, the things like when to bring the stone or metal, or different metals, from which region, for example the Himalayas, river bank, Shamshayana equals the cremation ground, the metal should be brought and when to start the idol creation are all decided with respect to the type of deity and done according to the position of the sun, moon, planets and the constellations. After that, it is kept for some time period for processing and purification using mantras. The person, S, who makes the idol, the mantras to be repeated, while making the idol, the place of idol creation and the time period in which the idol creation has to be completed also matters a lot. But, exceptions are there in every field and so are in the field of idol worship. If your devotion, Bhakti, is pure, there is no need of Marti Vigjayan or Pradhan Prathista. God will come running to accept your worship in whichever thing you want to worship him. This is the reason why 95% of the Hindus performing idol worship are still ignorant and have sufferings in their lives, because neither do they have the knowledge, mastery over the Murti Vigjayan, Pranam Prathista nor do they have pure Bhakti. Nobody is forcing Zakir Nayak to accept Ganesh as God. But if you, Zakir Nayak, really want to find out the truth, instead of making fun of Hindu gods and goddesses, then come and get Mantra Diksha of Ganesh Darshan Mantra from a Siddha and follow the directions given by him. And during this whole period, don't accept Ganesh as a god, take it, as you are doing some kind of experiment. If Ganesh comes before your eyes, then accept him, as a god, and if he doesn't come, then do, as you wish. The whole idea behind Hinduism is freedom of life and to check the existence of the truth and not like the Islam, where you have to blindly believe everything without observing, asking and experimenting. How can a boy love a girl whom he has not seen, not heard, know nothing about her, cannot imagine her, as her shape is formless? It is the nature of human mind to have an object first and only then can we use our emotions. If Zakir Nayak and the Muslim community thinks that they are of such high consciousness that they can perform formless worship of God from an initial stage, then do the true formless worship in which you cannot use any sound, book, ritual, place or any other thing. I know, it's impossible, because formlessness of God can only be experienced, it cannot be practiced. Can you practice the sweetness of sugar? Nope. It can only be experienced by tasting the sugar and so is the formlessness of the god by realizing him. Now, I would like to add more logical questions on Ganesh besides the ones asked earlier. 1. Why did Shiva had to go through the door to meet Parvati? If he is omnipresent, why not just appear before Parvati? 2. Shiva, who is the creator of the universe can't he create one human head for Ganesh, what was the need to replace it by an elephant's head? 3. Why can't Ganesh himself change his head back to human form? If he is a god, he should be capable of doing it. First of all, as Zakir Nayak says Shiva didn't recognize his own son, where is such a thing written that Shiva didn't recognize Ganesh? Both Shiva and Ganesh knew they were father and son. The moment Parvati created and ordered Ganesh, no one should be allowed to get in. The Lila play of Shiva Parvati started. The test here was to check how well Ganesh would follow his mother's order. No one, even if it was Shiva himself, should be allowed to get in, and Ganesh sacrificed his life in obeying his mother's order. As a result of it, he obtained the boon to be worshipped first before any other god or goddess is worshipped. And for the elephant's head, it is Shiva Shakti's and Ganesh's will to have it and so he is having it. You cannot ask why, because it would be like asking to someone why you like pink color, why you like orange flavor, why you hate rock music etc etc etc. 
Everyone has their own tastes, likes and dislikes, you cannot apply logic there. If, at this very instant, Ganesh decides to change his elephant's head to any other form, he will do it and then it will be revealed to the earth by the lineage of the great rishis, sages. I thank all for watching and hearing this video and I once again apologize to Muslim community for using the aggressive language at some places but in my deepest intentions I never meant them by heart. As told earlier I used Dr. Zakir Naik's style to answer the questions in form of logical arguments. Every religion is good and having some controversial thoughts, incidents, stories etc. Rather than spending energies in criticizing other religions one should concentrate on his slash her inner self to find out the true answers. Religion definitions will always depend on the perception of receiver. There is nothing good, nothing bad, nothing worst, what eventually matters in the end is how you perceive that knowledge and implement in your daily life. Let's get out of religion and concentrate on things like humanity and spirituality for the time being. Thanks.